hello everyone in today's class on advanced characterization techniques we are going to study low energy electron diffraction now an electron diffraction is something that we have encountered in earlier section of our course wherein we studied diffraction in a transmission electron microscope as well as in a scanning electron microscope for a technique known as electron backscatter diffraction however in today's class we are going to focus on a completely new technique or a rather a completely different technique known as low energy electron diffraction which is used to characterize uh, the surfaces of crystalline materials. So talking about leads, low energy electron diffraction is essentially used for atomic structure of surfaces and the first experimental observation of low energy electron diffraction was given by an experiment carried out by Davison and Gramer way back in 1927. However, the evolution of the field took quite a few uh, decades and it was not until 1970s that LEADS was used as a surface characterization tool in laboratories over the world. So as we already know as the name suggests rather, this essentially corresponds to diffraction from electrons with low energy in the uh, range of 20 to, 50 elect uh, to 500 electron volt. You, uh, we are aware that once the electron uh, electrons uh, interact with matter that leads to elastic as well as inelastic scattering. The inelastically scattered electrons get lost uh, if the penetration depth is higher within the sample. However, if the penetration uh, depth is only few surface uh, uh, layer, then we, the electrons that are getting diffracted do carry a lot of uh, surface information that can be utilized to get an idea about the structure of the surfaces. We will try to see how essentially it works out in the next few slides. But before that, let us first compare X-ray crystallography which we had covered in the last uh, 3 or 4 classes with lead crystallography. So as we all are aware of, X-ray crystallography essentially deals with bulk structures, right? while lead crystallography essentially deals with surface structures. I would like to emphasize that uh, X-ray crystallography can be used even to get uh, information about the surfaces. However, the major focus of X-ray crystallography is on bulk structures. Another important thing is that we do not need uh, a, a, a particular uh, sample preparation technique or rather a particular sample preparation uh, condition for carrying out X-ray crystallography. At the same time, any arbitrary uh, sample shape can be used in X-ray crystallography while we need extremely flat and oriented surfaces for carrying out lead crystallography. Surface impurities generally do not play an important role in X-ray crystallography while they are very very important in lead crystallography. Generally X-ray diffraction experiments are carried out at ambient uh, temperatures and uh, conditions. However, we need ultra high vacuum for carrying out lead crystallography. You are also aware that for X-ray crystallography, the diffraction condition is satisfied for a particular wavelength or a particular angle depending on the condition of Bragg's diffraction. However, the diffraction conditions are pretty much relaxed and they get satisfied at almost all energies and angles when it comes to low energy electron diffraction. We had seen that in normal uh, X-ray crystallography, uh, kinematic theory of diffraction uh, generally works out and at the same time we can generally neglect the absorption with the exception of grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering. However, when we come to low energy electron diffraction we have to deal with dynamical theory of diffraction and which also accounts for huge amount of absorption uh, in uh, case of low energy electron diffraction. And the basic difference between say something like uh, uh, say uh, X-ray crystallography is that it gives us 3D information while a lead crystallography gives us two dimensional information of the lattice. Having talked about it, let us go back and try to revise how actually diffraction takes place and this is something that we had covered in the very first class wherein we saw that we have for every lattice we have a corresponding reciprocal lattice associated with it during diffraction we use a particular wavelength which decides the diameter of the evolved sphere and all X-ray diffraction or for that matter all diffraction techniques are based on orienting either the crystal or the uh, 
of, uh, or the evolved sphere in such a manner so that the diffraction condition is satisfied. However, as you can easy, easily visualize from this image which we had uh, seen earlier, diffraction is essentially a 3D phenomena. However, since we are dealing with surface structures, if we jump from three dimensional uh, three dimensions to 2D, we do see the same construction in 2D. And this figure also we had again seen and herein we see the evolved sphere and the limiting sphere which is a larger sphere and the condition for a diffraction in two dimensions. However, the situation is not uh, uh, as simple and a real picture of this is given through taking a view of the reciprocal space. So, in this case we have taken a section of AG111 surface uh, that is the section of the uh, 111 uh, play, uh, surface uh, illustrating accessible range of XRD in grazing incidence mode which shows the red part. So, herein this is our evolved sphere and you can imagine that uh, we can, you can always draw a, s uh, a sphere uh, comprising of uh, consist uh, with, with diameter twice that of the diameter of the evolved sphere which comprises of the limiting sphere. However, what lead essentially offers us is this dotted view or rather the dotted circle essentially shows the region which can be viewed uh, the region of the reciprocal space that can be viewed with low energy electron diffraction. So, we can see that part of the region which is not accessible through grazing incidence x-ray diffraction is essentially available through uh, low energy electron diffraction and this is what is the USP of this particular characterization technique. So, as we can see with the change in wavelength with the uh, increase in uh, energy there is a decrease in wavelength and therefore an increase in the diameter of the evolved sphere. So, here in this figure we can clearly see that the information given by lead is completely different it is shown here by the green arrows or the green uh, lines over here. So, this is this part or this view of reci uh, reciprocal space is provided by lead while the red part the red uh, region shown uh, red lines shown over here is essentially provided by normal uh, a, a grazing incidence x-ray diffraction. There is another technique which is known as spot profile analysis low energy electron diffraction uh, or what is known as SPA lead which gives us information about exactly uh, perpendicular to the plane and herein we can get a lot of information about the, uh, uh, the, uh, the dimensions of the features on the surface along the z axis. We will talk more about it in uh, the next few slides, but let us try to understand how exactly uh, two dimensional uh, diffraction works. So, you can imagine that once we move from 3D structures to 2D surfaces, the reciprocal space essentially transforms to something like a reciprocal plane. So, instead of having a space group, we do have a plane group. We are aware that there are 32 point groups in 3D and there are 10 point groups in 2D. When you talk about space groups, we have something like 230 space groups in 3D and 17 plane groups in 2D, right. Uh, so, the obvious question arises is that when we are looking at say two, uh, 2D patterns of uh, films or islands which are on the surface, are we seeing the 2D structure? Well, the answer is not really true because we are not seeing the existing 2D planes. Instead, we have to keep in mind that lead is a two dimensional projection of 3D lattice and therefore, we are not restricted to the 17 plane groups or 10 uh, point groups in 2D. Instead, we are left with 80 diperiodic space groups. However, the good news is most of them or rather all of them have been accounted for and there are tables like we have tables for all these 32 point groups and 230 space groups even uh, the crystallography community is quite aware of the 80 diperiodic space groups which are existing and uh, uh, this information can be used to characterize or rather to index the obtained diffraction pattern. Talking about how exactly uh, the diffraction occurs in 2D, this is just the extension of, uh, from the figure which we had shown uh, a couple of slides ago. So, here we can have two cases uh, or rather two conditions when it comes to low energy electron diffraction, we can have a normal incidence wherein you can see that your incidence wave is perpendicular to the lattice over here at 0, 0, 0. At the same time, in one case we can have uh, uh, incidence which is not normal, which can be seen over here. 
in this particular slide. So here we can see that if the incidence is not normal, we can we do get a uh, diffraction. However, this diffraction component can then be classified into a parallel uh, uh, component, uh, a com the component which is parallel to the surface and a component which is perpendicular to the surface. Right. So, this way we, we can, you can imagine that there are two uh, implications uh, or rather two conditions wherein we can have either normal incidence or we can have non-normal incidence in low energy electron diffraction. Now, this is very similar to what we have in case of X-ray diffraction. So, the concept remains the same only thing the implications are slightly different. So, talking about uh, uh, how exactly diffraction occurs, let us go back and look at th the diffraction in three dimensions. Now, this we are uh, this uh, equation we have come across plenty of times in the last few classes. So, the Bragg's law we know that you know n lambda is equal to 2d sin theta. Having said that, we know that how do we derive to this formula? We get and calculate, we go and calculate the extra path length that the uh, light uh, that x rays have traveled. In this case, it is a b plus b c and we know that if the extra the extra path length uh, or the path difference if it is an integral multiple of lambda we do get constructive interference and we essentially we end up getting diffraction therefore we have n lambda is equal to 2d sin theta however when we come to 2d we see that the uh, diffraction occurs in this way Having said that, we see that this is restricted only to the plane, only diffraction occurs only in one plane. There is no diffraction in the third dimension and therefore, the Bragg's law uh, gets modified into the 2D form as A sin theta is equal to n lambda. In this particular figure, we have given, uh, we have shown the actual thing, uh, the projection of the evolved sphere. So, here again we can see that instead of having a complete uh, space group, uh, we are having a plane group and therefore, instead of getting a criteria uh, for diffraction or deriving the structure factor in terms of h k l, we are just restricted to h and k. Depending on the geometry of the figure, you can see that you can derive the Bragg's law uh, for a 2D uh, uh, plane condition in such a uh, with this particular equation. So, this is very similar to our uh, Bragg's uh, our normal n lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta stuff because you can imagine that this particular uh, term 2 sin theta cos theta plus phi essentially accounts for the in incident angle and once taken on uh, this side this particular tell uh, uh, h square plus square root of h square plus uh, k square essentially tells us the distance something which is very uh, similar or analogous to the interplanar distance between the two uh, atoms in case of Bragg's law. So, we are all aware and I hope we have understood by now that essentially what we are seeing or what we expect to see in low energy electron diffraction is nothing but the actual reciprocal space corresponding to the 2D lattice under consideration. So, this is again the slide which we had covered that any crystal structure comprises of crystal lattice and unit cell content and the diffraction pattern associated with it has a reciprocal lattice and a structure factor. So, if we have a particular uh, crystal structure uh, with uh, uh, you know the unit cell and the atom sitting over it, we do get a diffraction pattern which is related in a particular way. So, what we are going to actually see in low energy electron diffraction is actually the same thing. Now, the beauty of low energy electron diffraction is that we are essentially looking at 2D structures. So, we can really look at a 2D structure in real space and visualize it in 3D uh, in 2D reciprocal space. So, I will just give an example. So, something like uh, uh, 111 plane uh, in FCC which has been shown over here. So, you can literally calculate it uh, how we can do that. So, I, I hope uh, you remember the formula for calculating uh, reciprocal uh, vectors right like uh, a star is equal to b cross c divided by a dot b cross c right. So, you, you can extend a similar formula and calculate the entire reciprocal space. Now, what actually happens in uh, low energy electron diffraction is that you actually see this and this is what I have shown. So, this is what we calculated and this is what you can see over here. So, in this case we see a low energy electron diffraction pattern of silicon 111 7 cross 7 deconstructed surface. So, you can see the symmetry gets directly reflected in the reciprocal space. 
Having said that, up till now I have just focused and showed you like what all we can do on the surfaces, right? Like looking at the uh, structure of the surfaces and all. But there are other important things for entire the entire branch of surface chemistry that deals with absorption and desorption of various uh, uh, chemical entities on the surfaces. So low energy electron diffraction can be used not only to study the structure of the surface, but also to study the st uh, structure of the adsorbate as well as the substrate. So here uh, I have shown you a classical example wherein we have a substrate which, which uh, can be uh, characterized by uh, basis uh, vectors of A1 and A2 and uh, adsorbate. Now the adsorbate are sitting at a particular location and are, uh, if you draw the adsorbate lattice you end up getting a basis vector of B1 and B2. So this is what is actually existing in the real space. Now how what can you expect in the reciprocal space. So again we go about and uh, construct the reciprocal lattice of the substrate and then const, uh, construct the reciprocal lattice of the adsorbate. And then we know that you know what diffraction pattern we are going to get is going to be essentially a superposition of these two reciprocal lattices. And this is what we get uh, uh, as a result of this existing structure. Having said that what actually happens in an experiment is that we get we do start from something like this the, uh, the diffraction pattern and then we kind of go back and essentially derive the structure. But the point that I want to emphasize is that we can do a lot of surface uh, chemistry related uh, 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 studies using low energy electron diffraction. However, uh, uh, an important point that needs to be noted that what all we are talking about till now has be, uh, gives us uh, is only essentially qualitative information that we have obtained. There are quantitative, uh, quantitative results that can be obtained uh, through leads through uh, by lead but we will talk about it later. Let us now talk about the instrumentation aspect. So talking about lead uh, one of the most striking feature about low energy electron diffraction is the simplicity of the instrument. We talked about small angle x-ray scattering and grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering uh, in the last uh, two classes and we saw that they involved a lot of uh, instrumentation right and hardware. However, low energy electron diffraction as such is very very easy and this can be seen over here. So all you need is a nice electron gun which gives you electrons with an energy in the range of 20 to 500 electron volts. Now this is much lower than what we have in a say a TM or even a scanning electron microscope. So we need a small electron gun and a entire uh, and a vacuum chamber wherein we keep the sample. The vacuum chamber also comprises of G1, G2, G3 which are nothing but the grids at different potentials and the screen to obtain the signal uh, of electrons after diffraction. So essentially the electron gun acts as, uh, releases electrons on the samples. The electrons get diffracted uh, partly G1 uh, is the grid which is essentially grounded while G2 and G3 are kept at a negative potential to ward off the inelastically scattered uh, electrons and only diffracted electrons go back and hit the screen and this uh, electrons what we are getting we do observe them uh, using an external detector. So as I had already mentioned we need the, ins the instrumentation part is very very easy and all we need is electron gun, hemispherical grids, a screen and a detector. Now the electron beam has to have energy of about 20 to 500 electron volt with current of 10 nano amperes to 10 micro amps. We another important point is we do need a very strong magnetic shield to expel residual magnetic fields and the sample has to be focused for hemispherical uh, grids. The elastically scattered electrons which carry all the diffraction information have to reach the screen while the inel in inelastically scattered electron constitute the background and they have to be uh, kind of uh, reflected off. This is achieved by giving uh, the lens G1 ground while lens G2 and G3 are kept at a negative potential. Now what all pattern is forming on the screen can be obtained on a photographic film or a video camera. 
Now, one of the important uh, condition for getting, uh, for carrying out successful low energy electron diffraction is that the sample surface has to be extremely clean. At the same time, lead gives us information only for crystalline materials which undergo diffraction. We can use lead to detect various adsorbate. At the same time, you can appreciate that if at all there are uh, some defects like steps or kings on the surface or for that matter if there is some kind of relaxation occurring on the surface, we do can capture this information using low energy electron diffraction. Therefore, uh, electron diffraction, uh, certain features like irregular steps lead to blurred or streaky pattern while kinked surfaces lead to additional spot or spots in different direction uh, of the step direction. So, I would like to emphasize that when we talk about irregular steps or kinked surfaces, essentially we are talking about atomic level of irregularity or kinking. So, this kind of uh, ability to really study the uh, structure at atomic level is provided by low energy electron diffraction only. So, we have seen the kind of low uh, result we get with low energy electron diffraction, wherein we see nice spots. Now, there lies a wealth of information in the shape and distribution of diffraction spots obtained in low energy electron diffraction. The spot intensity and position correspond to the structure factor. Well, this is what we had uh, agreed that actually what we see in low energy electron diffraction is the reciprocal space. At the same time, the spot profile can give us a lot of information about the defect structure. This is what we saw that the irregular steps lead to blurring and streaky pattern. Therefore, we, we can see that the uh, spot position as well as the spot intensity and profile carries a lot of information about the surface structure of the material under consideration. Therefore, we can see that low energy electron diffraction offers us qualitative information about symmetry of surface structures. It also gives us information about size and orientation of adsorbate with respect to substrate. It gives us quantitative information uh, of the atomic positions on the surface from IV plots. This aspect we are going to cover uh, in the next few slides. I would like to mention that uh, this is a very involved topic and we are going to just touch upon uh, this uh, aspect and uh, see that what all we can do with uh, uh, you know IV plots rather than knowing how we can do uh, surface uh, uh, structure analysis using IV plots. Another technique that I had mentioned earlier, which was the spot profile uh, analysis uh, low energy electron diffraction, it gives us information about the lateral and vertical lattice constants of, surf of uh, say islands on the substrate. It also gives us complete island dimensions and reduced screen. Uh, however, it has a problem that the screen size uh, offered by SPA uh, lead is much lower compared to conventional low energy electron diffraction. Therefore, depending on our need, we can choose either the lead option or the SPA lead option. I would also like to mention that one thing that we should uh, keep in mind that since we are using electrons for diffraction, we can always use the same electrons for uh, imaging purpose and just use our simple low energy electron diffraction setup as a electron microscope and to get some image uh, to get an electron image and go to the region of our interest and then try to get uh, diffraction from that particular region. Another important point that needs to be discussed is we talked about uh, just a single or a diffraction event uh, occurring uh, which le leads to formation of the reciprocal space. However, as we had mentioned earlier that low energy electron diffraction comprises of dynamic scattering from various uh, layers of atoms. Now, this makes it necessary to account for intensity of the spots. It is therefore necessary to determine the amplitude and phase of the diffracted beam. However, we know that the phase of the uh, beam cannot be determined uh, using a detector. However, the intensity gives us uh, still gives us a lot of information uh, and this is achieved by using a CCD camera uh, in the low energy electron diffraction uh, setup. So, just to illustrate how does dynamic uh, diffraction occurs, this is the classical uh, 2D uh, diffraction that we had seen 
in the earlier slide. However, when we go and have a dynamic event, right, we do see that the diffraction occurs not only from the surface, but also from another, from the uh, another level uh, or the another plane. Now, depending on the kind of things we are having, that if you have a adsorbate on the substrate, so we can get uh, diffraction not only from the adsorbate atom on the substrate, uh, on the substrate, but also and substrate atom which is below the adsorbate. So, we can you can imagine that these multiple dynam uh, or rather these multiple scattering events are similar to what we talked about in grazing incidence small angle x-ray scattering. So, this essentially ensures that this uh, that our Born approximation of single uh, diffraction is no longer valid and we need to modify it extensively. Now, this dynamical scattering can be caused because of ion core scattering because of multiple scattering as we had already seen in elastic events like the ones that I had mentioned earlier and at the same time it can occur because of surface vibrations due to temperature. We will come to it and we will not go in details and try to find out how exactly this all happens, but all this carries important information on the interlayer spacing in terms of like what is the adsorbate and the substrate interlayer spacing the height of the adsorbate atoms as well as relaxation phenomena like how uh, relaxation is occurring on a free surface. Now, this can be obtained as I had already mentioned by measuring the intensity as a function of incidence angle and incidence energy. We know that if the incidence angle and the incidence energy uh, changes, there is a change in intensity. So, by systematically studying the variation of intensity as a function of incidence angle or incidence energy, we do can get different conditions of dynamic diffraction and then derive back the structure in details. So, here in, in this image, I have just given you a glimpse of how actually we can compare kinetic versus dynamic low energy electron diffraction. So, herein we see that if at all we are getting kinetic uh, diffraction, we see a nice periodic variation of intensity. Now, this essentially occurs, I hope you uh, occurs be, uh, because of only single scattering event. Now, all these peaks that you are seeing essentially corresponds to spot, right, all the diffraction spots and if you plot the intensity of it and get uh, intensity versus uh, uh, your energy. Uh, peak uh, uh, versus energy curve, you see that we get a nice periodic pattern. However, if there is dynamic diffraction, you see that there is a lot of noise in uh, the, the diffraction pattern. Now, the trouble is it is much easier for, uh, for us to kind of uh, you know assume a particular structure and reproduce the diffraction pattern using single, uh, single uh, scattering event. However, when we talk about dynamic scattering event, I hope you can see that each peak over here corresponds to a different scattering event, something what we had uh, noted down over here and all these events have to be accounted for in order to reproduce this kind of a diffraction curve. And I hope you appreciate that once we are in the dynamic low energy electron diffraction regime, uh, getting information uh, uh, about the structure is very, very difficult. Having said that, one thing that cannot be disputed is that the dynamic lead carries a lot more information than a kinematic lead uh, or a lead occurring due to kinematic diffraction. Therefore, it is very important to see what is the effect of theta as well, of, uh, as, well as that of energy uh, on the intensity. So, herein I have just uh, shown uh, the uh, effect of energy uh, on the beam uh, intensity. So, uh, this is for copper 100, uh, 100 surface and herein we can see that all the peaks that we are having over here, they not only change their position, but also their profile. So, look at this peak which is at around 100, we see that with the change in, in uh, our incidence angle which is shown over here, you see that not only the peak position is shifting, you can see here the peak position is shifting. In fact, even the peak profile is changing. Now, this essentially indicates that as we change our incidence angle, we are not only getting a change in the kind of uh, in the intensity of diffraction or just the structure factor. In fact, we are getting additional scattering events. Now, all these scattering events are to be accounted for when we try to back calculate 
the structure from the low energy electron diffraction data. So, again to go back all these kind of uh, electron uh, uh, rather scattering events the multiple scattering events that are likely to occur they have uh, they have been tab uh, tabulated and are well known. So, actually once we get this kind of a pattern our job is to essentially assume a structure and then consider all these diffraction events and try to reproduce this diffraction pattern. However, this is much uh, easier said than done and as we had already seen that we use Born approximation of single scattering for kinematic lead. However, for dynamic scattering if we start looking at all the events that are occurring it becomes very difficult and therefore, we follow a particular strategy wherein we consider the hierarchy of diffraction. So, the at the lowest level we have the atomic scattering wherein we get scattering from the substrate uh, from the adsorbate atoms right. So, that is the atomic scattering or for that matter uh, diffraction from the first atomic layer. So, that corresponds to atomic scattering. The second level of hierarchy is the layer scattering right. So, if you have an adsorbate on a substrate the diffraction occurring from the entire adsorbate that corresponds to your layer diffraction. However, depending on your energy or your angle of incidence you can also get diffraction from the crystal itself or the substrate itself. So, again going back you can see here that that is what seems to be uh, happening that as your uh, incidence angle is increasing we see that you know there is merging of these peaks you you have a peak which essentially first disappears and then again it reappears. So, what exactly is happening? So, you can understand we can try to understand it in terms of hierarchy of diffraction and get some idea on it. Now, when we actually get the low energy electron diffraction data we account for all these events to model that data. Now, our entire job once you get this uh, your uh, spectra is to obtain or rather a simulated get a simulated spectra which shows a good match with the experimental spectra. However, having said that uh, it is very difficult to kind of compare two spectra and therefore, we use what are known as R factors to quantitatively compare the spectra and there have been two strategies which have been used till date. They include uh, mean square deviation and Pendry R factor. Uh, so, I need not emphasize much on mean square deviation where we see that you know that the mean uh, square deviation is minimum in the simulated and uh, the experimental pattern while in Pendry R factor approach we see that the location of maximum maxima is more important. I would not go in details, but I would just like to emphasize uh, that uh, what we are trying to do is we, uh, we assume different uh, diffraction uh, events at uh, 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 corresponding to different hierarchies and try to simulate the diffraction pattern or the diffraction spectra. However, we do see that there are lots of parameters that are to be used to fit the spectra and to know how good our fit is we do use the, these two strategies. Now, our r is a function the r factor which I showed is a function of many uh, of many parameters and deciphering the exact structure though is uh, is possible is very very complicated. However, there are some advances made in data analysis and one of the latest advantage or one of the latest advancement is what is known as tensor lead wherein the computational effort required is reduced drastically. Now, in case of tensor lead what essentially we end up doing is that we start with a reference structure and perturbate it to get exact IV curves the intensity versus voltage curves. So, this essentially ensures that we start with a structure and perturbate it and uh, uh, to get some idea about the IV curve and, we, and once we get an exact match according to the uh, R factor we are we get sufficient information about the structure of the surface. I am not touching upon and going in details of uh, data analysis in this as in, in this part because it is too involved and is beyond the scope of uh, this particular uh, lecture. However, I want to emphasize uh, that essentially we can get a lot of information regarding not only the condition uh, of the uh, surface, but also a lot of information about the adsorbate on it not only the kind of adsorbate, but also the orientation of adsorbate using low energy electron diffraction. So, there is uh, to do all this da uh, data analysis there are dedicated softwares which are available. So, I have just listed down one of the uh, 
lead calculation home page wherein you can go and take your data and do the calculation. But calculation of your structure from low energy electron diffraction is a field in itself and it requires a lot of uh, analysis and understanding of the diffraction processes occurring in uh, two dimensions uh, in various materials. So, just to summarize I would like to emphasize that low energy electron diffraction provides surface and adsorbate size and symmetry. It is very good uh, or a very uh, sophisticated tool to study in situ processes like temperature effect and reconstruction and relaxation phenomena uh, in crystalline materials. It provides information from the top 1 to 10 atomic layers and can account for all the uh, surface uh, uh, reactions which are occurring in different materials. However, the presence of defects like kinks and uh, ledges can complicate the simple diffraction pattern that we had calculated uh, that we had envisioned from the uh, derivation of the reciprocal space. The I v uh, and I theta curves which gives us the variation of intensity with the voltage or uh, the incidence angle have a lot of information about the uh, not only the stru uh, structure and orient, uh, but also the orientation of the adsorbate and the surface, but they are very complicated and need a much careful analysis uh, to get uh, to derive any important information. Thank you.